Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be solving a really, really complex problem, so let's get right into it. Okay, so the problem is as such. We have sine of i, and in this case, i is the square root of negative 1. It is that imaginary number we've been working with for some time now. So yeah, let's jump right into the solution. Now, in traditional pre-calculus and tri trigonometry, you're taught many different ways of internalizing sine, and one of the which, I'm going to be drawing this diagram because we're going to be referring to it a lot, one of the w ways that you learn it is through the unit circle. And I'm sure there are a lot of calculus students here watching, so this might be a lot of review. But simply stated, the unit circle is just a circle with a radius 1. And every point on the unit circle is such that it has coordinates. And I'm going to draw this. This is the angle is x, I'm going to call in radians. The coordinates of that point in green right there is cosine of x, comma, sine of x. Meaning this distance right here is sine of x. This value right here is sine of x, and this is cosine of x. So this is very fundamental to understanding everything in today's video. But yeah, so I'm going to be taking this and putting it on the side right here. So with this understanding, when we say sine of i, to understand the question, we have to know that i is referring to the value of x, the angle in this case. So we're traditionally working, used to working in radians and degrees and all of that. And we understand that like, hey, if we have a number, we go around like this much. In radians, this is 2 pi or 360 degrees. But what does i degrees mean or i radians even mean? So that's when we move into our complex plane. So as I just drew the unit circle, I'm going to completely duplicate this. And then I'm just going to simply add imaginary and real. So now we're in the complex plane because our y-axis is replaced for the imaginary axis, and this is now real. Except the only difference is now that instead of cosine x, uh, so we have cosine x for the x-coordinate of that green point, and on the uh, y-coordinate we have i sine x because we're working with the imaginary plane right here. So this would likewise be i sine x. So I think we're ready to get into the solution now. All right. So a really, really great mathematician, I keep, I keep talking about this man because he's so brilliant. His name is Euler, and I'm sure you've heard of him if you've taken calculus classes or anything else, maybe even in pre-calculus. But Euler came up with a lot of little ton of formulas that we use today, and most famously, he's known for his number E, which is 2.7182818, and it goes on and on and on and on. Now, E, just a little sidetrack, it, it can be defined by different limits and all. It's a really cool number. It shows up in finances too and a bunch of other applications. But for today's video, we're going to be using some, something really cool that Euler came up with. It's called Euler's formula, and it's the one he's no, most known for. It goes as such. E to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine theta. Just like that. So when we define a point on the complex plane right here, we define it by its distance right here, we'll call that A, and we call it BI. So that, that point right there is A plus BI. That's how we define it on here. Now, what Euler is saying is that this green, I'll, yeah, I'll make it orange now, that orange point, which we just said because of the unit circle, is cosine of x, comma, I sine of x, or yeah, um, he's saying that that's equal to e to the i theta, or e to the i x. That's the reason that here. So that point itself is equal to e, that number 2.71828, to the power of i x, like that. Now, this might be a little confusing because I'm using that point-based notation, which I use for the Cartesian plane, like all in the real, sorry, I mean the real plane with the real axes. But um, something to note here is when we're referring to complex numbers and points here, we commonly refer to the position as a sum of two two different terms. So as I said, we had a plus bi. We don't see a comma bi traditionally. We say a plus bi because we're adding that imaginary component. This, um, this is the imaginary component, bi. So we're adding that to our point. And just to clarify. So now that we understand what Euler's formula is saying, that e to the i x is equal to cosine of, cosine of x plus i sine x, we can now move to the solution. By the way, if you guys want a proof for this, I will be doing that soon, and let me know if you really want to see that, because I'll, I'll be doing that. Now, moving forward, we can apply our standard algebra rules to this formula, because all math is valid. So let's do that. Um, we're going to say, we're going to plug in a value for theta real quick. I'm going to rewrite this as e to the i times negative theta in the exponent. So what would this be equal to? This would be cosine of everywhere you see the theta here, like this, you're going to be replacing it with negative theta. 
I have negative theta plus I sine of negative theta, just like that. So we're making good progress. Now, let's see if we can simplify this a little more. We have e to the negative i theta is equal to, what is cosine of negative theta? Well, if you look at the cosine graph, <laughs> uh, that's, I guess that's okay. If I have a point right here, um, so uh, let's see right here. Yeah, 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 this is what I mean. So if I have a point right here, let's say that I, this distance is going to be called x. And the value of cosine right here is a. It's this certain height a, because that's the function value. Now, when I go negative x in the opposite direction, um, it should be like right there, but I didn't draw my, pro my graph correct, like perfectly, but this value would be a as well, and it's the same value. So this means that cosine is an even function, because if you reflect this part of the graph over the y-axis like that, it'll be all perfectly symmetrical. Or if you rotate it, or, or if, I mean, if you like, it's like perfectly symmetrical in regards to the y-axis, just like that. So that's what we mean when we say cosine is an even function. But what that means is cosine of x is equal to cosine of negative x. So we don't have to worry about that. That's an even function. I'll write that on the side right here. Now, now that means we can write that e to the negative i theta is equal to cosine of theta, because it's the same thing. And now we look at the term i sine of negative theta. So we can apply the same concept and just draw the graph of sine of theta, just like that. So if I take a value x right here, and this is my function of negative sine, uh, of sine of the x, I get that this is right here is just sine of x. Now let me move x in the opposite direction. Maybe I should draw my graph a little better. It should be like that. Um, let's do this. So I apologize for the poor graph, guys. So if I go x in the opposite direction, I, get, I go negative x here. This point is just sine of negative x, because that's how I moved. But it turns out that this distance right here is just the negative of this distance. So we call this distance a, which is sine of x, and then this is just negative a, because that's how the sine function works. So this is called an odd graph. It is not even. If you rotated this graph about the origin, 180 degrees, it would be the same. So if you move this graph of sine of x like this, you moved it and you rotated it, you keep rotating, you keep rotating, you would get back to exactly this function if you rotated it 180 degrees, just like that. So that's what we mean when we say it's an odd function. So now with this understanding, we can now proceed forward. We have e to the negative i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus, or I should make this minus now, oops, minus i sine of theta, just like that. So now we don't have any negative theta anywhere, and it looks nice and clean. So what can we do with this? Let's see. What happens if we subtract our first equation that Euler proved of e to the i theta from e to the negative i theta? What happens? So we have e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta, just like this. Now we plug in what we had earlier. We have cosine of theta, oops, cosine of theta plus i sine theta. Oh, wow. Plus i sine theta minus all of this. So we have minus cosine of theta minus i sine of theta. Parentheses are important. So now let's just simplify. What do we get? We get e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta is equal to i sine theta. And this cancels because we're, we're minusing, so I didn't write that. And then what happens with the negative negative? You're adding i sine theta and i sine theta. This becomes 2i sine theta, just like that. So ladies and gentlemen, if you actually pause for a moment and just internalize what we just did, we just came up with another definition for sine. Because if you divide by 2i on both sides, you get sine of theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta all over 2i. And that's a remarkable definition because it's indeed true. Now, I know many people here might be familiar with complex analysis or dealing with imaginary numbers, but we will talk about that later when we, when we actually have to deal with some weird constraints. But for now, we can just see that sine of theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta all over 2i. So given a certain value of theta, we can use this formula to get the value of sine. Now, what was our, our original problem? Let's see. We had sine of i. So can we just plug in i now? Yeah, we can. Let's go for it. 
That means sine of i is equal to e to the i times i minus e to the negative i times i all over 2i. Let's simplify a bit. We get sine of i is equal to e to the, uh, to the negative 1, because i squared is negative 1, minus what is negative i times i. i squared is negative 1. Negative i squared is 1. So we have minus e to the 1 all over 2i. And can we do anything more? Let's see. We have sine of i is equal to, I'm going to pull out the negative. We get negative e minus 1 over e all over 2i. Or you can keep it like e to the negative 1. So, ladies and gentlemen, you might think that we're done. You might think that this is our answer, and you might be quite satisfied that sine of i is equal to this nice expression involving that cool number, 2.718, and there's an i involved as well because we did have an i in the expression. But it turns out we can go a little step further. So you could stop watching here, but I encourage you to keep going. So let's go. We have sine of i is equal to... Now, let's take a look here. You don't really like having an i in the denominator. It's not really good practice. So what we commonly do in mathematics is we just multiply by i over i. i over i is 1. Um, there's no disagreement there. And that allows us to eliminate that, neg that i in the denominator. So we get sine of i equals, I'm going to use this color again, is equal to negative i times e to the minus e to the negative 1. And on the bottom, we get 2i squared, and that's just negative 2. So we see the negative and negative cancels quite nicely. We have sine of i is equal to i over i, um, let's do it like this, e minus e to the negative 1 over 2 times i. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is where it begins to get a little bit cool. So you'll notice that this function is nice and clean, except if you are familiar with hyperbolic geometry, or the hyperbolic trigonom trigonometry, you might know that something looks quite familiar here. So, little sidetrack. Commonly, we just talked about how we defined sine of x as the y coordinate right here, given an angle theta, and cosine x is this x, uh, this x value right here, which is just like this, cosine of theta, and this is sine of theta. So this is what we're commonly taught in school, but what's less known is about hyperbolic geometry and hyperbolic trig functions. So, if I have a hyperbola, this is commonly taught in Algebra 2 or some other classes, and I take a point right here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is given an angle of x. So, if you have an angle of x and a point right there, this y coordinate, this y, the y value of that point, is equal to sine h of x. So, this is a new function, pronounced cinch of x, or some people say shine of x. So, there's many ways of pronouncing it, but I like to say cinch, feels cooler. And now, this, this is cosh of x. So, cosine hyperbolic. That, the h stands for hyperbolic. So, don't worry if you, if you don't quite get it yet, but the, the general idea is we can abstract those, those functions for sine and cosine into something other than just a circle, into a hyperbola. So, let me make this a little bigger. Just like that. So that's the idea behind this. Now, how do we define sine, cinch of x? There's many ways of doing it, but believe it or not, surprisingly enough, cinch of x is equal to e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2. That is the definition of cinch of x, and it's quite remarkable. Cosh of x, you don't have to worry about this because we're going to be using cinch of x. So if we go back toward the solution we had for sine of i, let me bring this up we get that sine of i, sine of i, is equal to, now what does this entire thing right here look like if we, if we just compare it to the cinch of x? It looks like we did cinch of 1, because using our formula for, our, for right here, this entire formula, we have e to the 1 minus e to the negative 1 all over 2. So that is cinch of 1 indeed. Now, we can just replace that accordingly. We have cinch of 1 times i. 
Now, the function cinch of x has a lot of applications outside of this video, of course, and many other worldly systems, um, just because, like, I think it also has to do with, like, a lot of physics, because bubbles go in a certain way, and they want to see certain points on, like, bubbles when they're connecting. There's many applications outside, and even optometry, and, and like, analyzing many different fields of science and biology. That is very cool. But it's very neat to know that literally sine of i is equal to cinch of 1. Such a nice number two times i which is our imaginary part of it so if you're wondering what this is equal to this is equal to i have it here it's equal to about 1.1752 dot 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 i so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed today's video let me know if you have any questions in the comments down below any thoughts if i made any mistake please i'm, I'm definitely all ears so yeah um best of luck drop a like and comment thank you guys see ya